sponsor for this next session is Alliance Defending Freedom. ADF is the world's largest legal organization committed to protecting religious freedom, free speech, marriage and family, parental rights, and the sanctity of life from courtrooms across the country all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court if necessary. To learn more, you can visit their website at adflegal.org. Our next speaker is a writer and activist. She founded and serves as president of Live Action, a human rights nonprofit with the largest digital footprint for the global pro-life movement. A native of San Francisco, Lila lives in California with her husband and son. Please welcome Lila Rose. Hello, Focus. I'm so honored to be with all of you guys. I wish we were together in person, but online is second best. And I hope it's been an awesome weekend so far for everybody. Some of you guys might know me or my work. My name is Lila Rose, and I'm the president and founder of Live Action. We are the largest educator for the pro-life movement globally. So we reach about several million people every single week with facts about human dignity and arguments for life encouraging motherhood, fatherhood, as well as exposing the violence of abortion and the abortion industry. This is an organization I started as a teenager and we've grown over the years. But most importantly, I am Catholic and I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a mom of two little boys. And I became Catholic when I was actually a college student. So I first got connected with Focus over 10 years ago when I was invited to speak at one of the events in person back then. Um, I think it was in Maryland or something or DC. And I was still a college student myself and traveling a lot, even as a student. But I found my Catholic faith as a student. And that's why I love the work of Focus because finding your faith as a student, encouraging students and young people in their faith, whatever your role is, deepening your faith at this pivotal time in your life is so important. And it was becoming Catholic in college because I was raised evangelical and I actually became, entered the Catholic church as a sophomore that transformed my life and gave me peace and joy that I didn't even know existed. So just to encourage you in your faith, you're, you're in the right place, you're doing the right things by even being part of this amazing event this weekend. And what I'm here to do in my talk today is I hope encourage you and equip you to stand up for life, to stand up to save the lives of those that are most in danger. I'm going to share more about that, as well as equip you to be able to change hearts and minds yourself, of the people around you, as well as actually save lives. Because it's not only possible to change hearts and minds on abortion and to save lives, but it is probable. It's something that we can actually do in our daily work if we're willing to put in the work. And that's the message I'm gonna want you to go away from this talk with, that it's not only possible, but it's probable. And here are some tools to get you started. So the whole of live action was actually built when I started it as a teenager in San Jose, California on the idea that hearts and minds can change. If you look at our country today and our world, there is so much confusion, misinformation, there's so much division and so many people who think that abortion is this good thing or it's a necessary thing or it's women's rights or empowerment or it's for choice and choice is a good thing. I mean, God gave us choices, so why not be for choice? But the first thing to do is to equip yourself with the facts and the arguments for the pro-life case so that you are in the position to be able to share that information with other people. We can't give what we don't have and we need to be equipped to be able to dialogue persuasively with other people. When I was starting live action, it was born out of learning certain facts and arguments. So there are a number of things that happened in my life that inspired and convicted me to say, this is the cause of our day. The fight to stop abortion and save lives of the preborn is the greatest human rights cause of our day. And there are certain facts and arguments that I learned that gave me this confidence and that I could then share with others and see that change their minds and change their behaviors. So what are some of those facts? I'm gonna start very the very basics here. The whole pro-life argument is built on the very simple scientific fact of when human life begins. 
our society is in this trance thinking that life begins at birth, that you're not a human until birth, unless of course it's a wanted baby, but if the baby's unwanted, then it's okay to abort that child. And so life doesn't begin until birth or life begins at the moment the child is sentient, you know, has enough of a brain development or the life begins of the child when the child is pain capable. All of these arbitrary lines are unscientific. It is clear if you open any biology textbook or if you sit down and talk to any embryologist or human biologist, it is clear when life begins. Life begins at the moment of fertilization when the mother's egg is fertilized by the father's sperm and a unique single cell individual human embryo comes into existence. And that single cell embryo is individual. It's distinct from his or her mother and father has complete genetic information to direct the development of that cell into many cells very rapidly to one day be as big as a newborn baby and then a toddler and then an adult. The eye color, hair color, thousands of other traits are already determined, the sex. And that child, that single cell embryo just needs time and nourishment to grow. So the first foundation is the fact of reality of when human life begins. And truth is about aligning our minds with reality. And when we're sharing truth with other, other people, our goal should be to help align their minds with reality. The reality of human life is that it begins at fertilization. So then the question becomes, what about human rights? And as I was learning this as a young teen, I was so convicted because I came to discover that abortion is not only something that happens in our country and globally, but that it is the leading cause of death that the, the killing of children in the womb, of humans in the womb, is the number one cause of death for humanity globally. In the United States today, 2,363 children are killed on average every single day. These are according to the Guttmacher Institute, which is Planned Parenthood's research arm, their own numbers. 2,363 children killed every single day. In the United States, in some states, in uh, over seven states, depending on how the, you know, the different regulations go, abortion is legal through all nine months. So there are children being killed, 2,363 of them, some of them old enough to survive outside the womb, many of them with beating hearts, that happens at just three and a half weeks after fertilization, the child's heart is beating. And this is because in 1973, the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, our laws decided to radically change to permit the killing of children in the womb. And it was called a woman's right. Seven men on the Supreme Court in 1973 in Roe v. Wade decided that abortion was somehow a constitutional right. And yet when you look at what's happened since then, the death tolls over 62 million children, the leading cause of death, more than heart disease, cancer, COVID, any other death cause. And that's not just in the United States, but that's globally. We're nearing 3 billion abortions globally because of the legalization and the mainstreaming of it throughout the globe. There is no human rights abuse, no genocide, no dictator that has achieved more bloodshed than abortion. And when you think about human rights, what is the first human right? You don't need to be Catholic to ascribe to this. What is the first human right? Well, you can't enjoy any of your other human rights like freedom, freedom to speak, freedom to assemble, freedom to do whatever you might wanna do in life, to marry. You can't do any of those other, enjoy any of those other human rights if you don't have the right to life, if your life isn't protected. The first job of the government is to protect and to secure the, 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 the national defense, to make sure that our country can actually exist and actually be safe enough to not be invaded, uh, for the people to not be killed. You're supposed to be able to walk down the street and not just be murdered. And then the, and the law should have repercussions for those that take your life. There should be uh, security so that you can live and live without being th under threat of being killed. And yet our legal system, which should protect the right to life first, because without that right, no other rights are possible. Our legal system actually deprives the first human right, which is life, of the most vulnerable members of our society, which are children in the womb. Children in the womb are the most dependent of any of us. They completely are dependent on their mother for their very existence to be able to grow. And when their first human right, which is life, is just stripped from them, which is what our legal system and our society has done, you have, you have injustice at the core of our legal system. And when you consider that we should be, as a society, protecting the weak, we should actually be making sure that the laws are not just designed to protect the strong, but the weak, a very unjust laws, one that 
refuses to protect the weak who need rule of law, who need the protection of the law, and instead empowers the strong to kill the weak or to harm the weak, that is an unjust law. And that's why we not only have the greatest human rights abuse in our country today, but it's against the most vulnerable members of society, children who deserve love and support and care. So seeing this from an issue, seeing this issue from a perspective, the correct perspective of human rights is very key to being persuasive, to helping people understand that this isn't some religious debate, this isn't even a political debate, but that this is a question of basic human rights. And if you are a member of the human species, then you have human rights. Innately, you have human rights. They are universal. A universal right is for everyone. That's the meaning of the term universal. It also is the meaning of the word Catholic, a universal faith for all peoples. And a child in the womb is just as human as anyone else. You don't become human at birth. You don't become human at some arbitrary line. As we, uh, as, as the biologist will tell us, humanity begins, your humanity, you become an individual human person at the moment of fertilization. So learning these things were very convicting for me. And just learning the death toll and thinking about this from a human rights perspective. And I discovered as a teen, when I was first starting live action, there was a Planned Parenthood abortion clinic just 10 miles from where I grew up. And it was killing a hundred children on average a week, up to 24 weeks old. So these are children at six months who technically can survive outside the womb. And this was just done legally. And I remember having this moment of moral clarity, thinking this is the greatest cause of death. It is against the most vulnerable. They're being stripped of their first human right. There's no greater human rights issue. What am I doing about it? How can I stay silent? How can I not do anything? And if more people just knew these facts, minds would change and hearts would open. And so we started giving presentations in churches and schools around the Bay Area, and we saw hearts and minds changed. And that's what we see at Live Action. When we share this kind of information, hearts and minds do change. A couple other keys to remember, the pro-life argument is very simple, and I'm going to share it with you now. We have a whole apologetic series at liveaction.org that you can go through, but this is one of the key tenets of the series. It's a logical syllogism. This is the pro-life argument boiled down very simply, and the logical syllogism goes like this. There's two premises and a conclusion. Number one, it is always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. And I think you could probably get any of your classmates, any of your friends, your professors even to agree with that. Most people agree. It is always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. Then the second premise in the logical syllogism and the argument, abortion kills an innocent human being. And they might say, well, it's not a human being. It's not a human life. It's very clear when a human life begins. The science is clear on that. There's no debate. It begins at the moment of fertilization with that single cell embryo. And what is abortion designed to do? Abortion is designed to kill. It is designed to not just end a pregnancy, but end the life of that child. I'm going to share a video here in a minute or two about the abortion industry, which is another key part of being equipped with facts so we can change hearts and minds. And the abortion industry is paid to kill children. And if the child is born alive, if it's a later term abortion and the child is born alive, that's an incomplete abortion and they can actually be sued for that. And there have been sued for that. And so the abortionist wants to end that life. They have successfully completed an abortion when the child is dead. And that's what an abortion is. It is the direct and intentional killing of an innocent human life. And so the conclusion of this argument, it is always wrong to kill an innocent human life. Abortion takes, kills an innocent human life intentionally, and therefore abortion is always wrong. That is the argument. That is the core of the pro-life movement. And so to share this and to explain it, to share the facts about how often it is happening, to share the facts of what abortion is and how it, how it actually operates. Most people have no idea that abortion is the dismemberment, the suctioning to death, the sometimes lethal injection in later trimesters of a child that is often moving, that almost always his or her heart is beating. The child's heart starts to beat at just three and a half weeks from the moment of fertilization. So many women don't even know they're pregnant yet. And that tiny little heart and that tiny little embryo is already beating away in order to start to send blood to the rest of the body so that child's body can continue to develop. It's amazing how quickly the child develops in just the first trimester. By the end of the first trimester, all the internal organs are present, present arms, legs, 
the tiny child's face is already formed. Knowing these facts, sharing them can be actually the, the difference between life or death for someone. There was just a post on live action social media today that I saw somebody saying I was pro-choice, but after getting this information and following live action, I'm now pro-life. And what information are we sharing? It's not rocket science. It's facts about human development, it's facts about abortion, and it's facts about the abortion industry. I wanna share with you now a video from one of our investigative reports. A big part of what we do and what I've done for over a decade now is investigative reporting of the abortion industry. Most people do not realize how brutal and how powerful the abortion industry is in America. It's hundreds of abortion clinics led by Planned Parenthood is the biggest abortion chain that is killing, as I said, two, over 2000 children every single day and profiting from their deaths. What are they doing? How are they operating in our states? They're certainly not helping women. They're actually hurting women in the process. A lot of this is something I've documented over the years, the sexual abuse cover up at abortion clinics, the aiding and abetting of sex traffickers at abortion clinics, the misinformation, the medical lies that are being told to women in abortion clinics. And meanwhile, the abortion industry is propped up, not just by the law, but they're propped up by taxpayers. You might not realize this, but we are funding, taxpayers are funding Planned Parenthood, which is the biggest abortion chain. They commit over a third of all abortions in this country. They're the biggest political proponent, lobbyist for abortion. And we are funding them over $1.7 million every single day. That is the power of the abortion industry politically, as well as socially to be in our communities operating legally and have the support of many people in media, many people in entertainment, many people in business. So all the more important that we equip ourselves with these facts, we study them, and then we share them with other people. The video, I'm gonna play it now, is a peek into the late-term abortion industry that's operating in this country. And the women in it who are the investigators are brave first time moms. So they're actually pregnant and many of their children, they're in the second trimester. So we'll play that video now. At this point, does it have like all of its organs and all of that stuff? Like is it already fully it's not developed. fully developed. Um, it doesn't even look like, it doesn't even look like a baby yet. It doesn't? It has parts, like we all have parts, but it's not so like, does it have a face or um, like all of that stuff? Or? Yeah, kind okay. of, yeah. So it's almost like we're guaranteed it's like, we're okay. It's a, yeah, okay. We, we induce a demise, an injury or a demise. What does demise mean? Uh, death. Okay. We use a combination of suction and then real instruments to literally go in and grab and pull pieces out. Okay. Okay. So maybe it's usually, that's a little more graphic than I usually describe it. For some I've reason, never had I'm not able to deliver. Well, you'll be able to get it out. Take it out in pieces. pieces. But, that, but that had 26 weeks. Very, very good. And what do you use to break it up? Just a whole what bunch of <laughs> Got a toolkit. I see. Okay. Does it ever like move or anything when it comes out? Or? That's why I try it and uh, sever the umbilical cord first, and we okay. wait for that to to stop pulsing, and that's why the. the uh, fetus is expired first, so it doesn't. Has it ever survived? After, well, when, After it, when it no, comes out? Not, not here, no. Usually at this point in the year, what do you do? It's, it's too early to survive usually. Okay. It will expire shortly after birth. But if it did, like what? What would happen? You know, technically, you know, legally, we would be uh, obligated to help it 
you know, to survive, but you know, it, it probably wouldn't. But would you make sure that it, like, yeah, it doesn't you know, that's survive? Yeah, things you do. Obviously, you're here for a certain procedure, and if, if your, your pregnancy were, let's say you went into labor, the membranes ruptured, then you delivered before we got to the termination part of the procedure here, you know, then we would do things, we, we, would, we would not help it, let's, okay. let's say. It's very painful to watch and hear this, but it is exactly showing these facts, showing and exposing the abortion industry for what it is that changes hearts and minds. The next thing besides being equipped with facts and the argument for life is to be equipped and understand our role as Catholics. Our Catholic faith has had a tremendous transformation in Western civilization over the last 2000 years. Jesus Christ, when he founded our church back when he was just coming into the world, he, he lived and died for us. He dramatically transformed the view of the human person. So he was born into the Roman empire, as you know, when he was born, King Herod actually called for the killing, the slaughter of all boys under the age of two. Imagine a king or you know, a governor or a mayor in the United States calling for this because they hate the idea that a prophecy could come true and Jesus could be the, the Messiah, the savior and lead the Jewish people to freedom. This was an, an action that was not abnormal or unusual. There was so much violence against the innocent and the weak in the Roman empire. Women were considered less than human, or uh, less, than, less than men. Uh, children were considered like chattel, like they were basically the property of their parents and could be killed by their parents. Infanticide and abortion was frequently practiced. This is the world that Jesus was born into. Sex slavery was common. And when Jesus Christ came into the world, he came with this teaching that was so profound. He said that unless you become like a child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, let the children come unto me. He said in Christ, in me, and, and, and St. Paul said this about Christ, but he said in Christ, there is no male or female, slave or free. He was saying we're all equal in Christ. This is how, what Christ taught us. And Jesus Christ also said that whatever you do to the least of these, you do it unto me. And whatever you do not do to the least of these, you do not do to me. And who are the least of these? Those are the, that are the most vulnerable, the most disenfranchised, the most weak. And who were those people in the empire, the Roman empire at the time? Primarily children. And who are those people today? Children. Children have been always the most vulnerable. And so when Christianity started to take root and grow, the early Christians were passionately pro-life. And they actually would seek to adopt children that were, le were left to be exposed by their parents and left out in the wilderness to be eaten by wild animals or were just left on the roadside. They were abandoned and they would actually adopt many of these children. And you can see in the early church documents, like the Didache, which is like an early catechism. The Didache is an early catechism for the church in the second and third century. It actually specifically prohibited abortion for the early Christians, saying that you shall not commit abortion, you shall not take any abortion drug, explicitly noting the humanity, the sacred humanity of the child in the womb. Jesus himself coming into the world as a child in the womb, as an, as an embryo. That's how God came into the world showing the humanity and the sacredness of every single life. So our Catholic faith gives us a strong command to go out and spread this message of the sanctity of life, the gift and the beauty of life, and to fight for the vulnerable. And Jesus Christ taking on radical solidarity with the least of these by saying, whatever you do unto me, you do to the least of these, is a strong command to us to treat the least of these as Christ himself. So to be pro-life, you don't have to be Catholic to be pro-life, but if you are Catholic, you are passionately pro-life. And when I became Catholic in college, I became even more passionately pro-life. And of course, now becoming a mother and a wife, I'm even more passionately pro-life. But this is not just the human rights issue of our day. 
But spiritually speaking, this is one of the greatest spiritual battles of our day. So beyond knowing the facts, knowing the arguments, sharing them, how can we concretely save lives? And so there's three more things I want to leave you with. First of all, it's key that we do not compromise. We do not say, oh, we're pro-life in only some circumstances. Oh, you know, there's other issues that I'm going to just pay attention to and not think about this one. In order to actually take this seriously and make the difference we need to make to change minds and to save lives, we cannot compromise either on the truth of when life begins and its sacredness or on public policy when it comes to saving lives or on uh, you know, even how we communicate with friends or family on this, we can't just um, not say anything or just let lies about human life or lies about abortion continue without us speaking out when we have the opportunity. And what do I mean by that? In politics, it does matter. Laws do matter. We need to be working as Catholics to hold politicians accountable who are not being fully pro-life if they said they were, or to say we will only vote for politicians who are pro-life. And yes, some politicians who are pro-life are not great. Maybe they are not actually being pro-life. So we need to work to find candidates that are actually representative of the pro-life cause and are going to work for pro-life policies. So that's one key. Another key is making sure that when we have a friend say that they're considering abortion or we know someone who's vulnerable, that we fight for that friend and the life of their child that we are open about the pro-life message with our friends and family. There should never be a situation where somebody close to us doesn't know where we stand on this issue and also doesn't know that we are willing to help them and serve them if they, they or someone they know is facing an abortion decision. So that's key is not compromising and being proudly pro-life and proud of our beliefs and open about our beliefs. The next thing is to serve families. This is both very personal and it has to do with how we interact in the public world. First of all, it's personal because if we're going to serve families and families of course are what is the answer to this abortion crisis, strong families that love children and strong marriages where mothers and fathers come together to create their families together. First of all, this means that we see sex as sacred and the way that God designed it. Think about it, if everybody, in our country change their behaviors and their attitudes. And instead of seeing sex as just you know pleasure and about what I want and about you know this feeling of love or whatever it might be, they see sex the way it was designed, that they don't have sex, that we encourage people not to have sex unless they're having sex with someone that they want to be the mother or father of their child. And they're married to that person and committed to them for life. The entire abortion problem would go away if people didn't have sex outside of marriage and if people got married to people that they shared values with and who they wanted to be the mother or father of their children. That is the core of the abortion crisis is our attitudes about sexuality and our behavior around sexuality. So to serve families, we have to first see family as sacred and not be starting families ourselves unless we're ready to have a family and we're married and supporting the families in our communities that have been started. How can we do this concretely? You can find ways to support foster care families. If there's broken families and you wanna shore up families, there are organizations where you can actually be a donor to foster care families. You can actually get training to be a big brother or sister for foster care kids. You can help other families in the community. Maybe there's a, a single mom who's struggling in her family. You can help her through a lot of different organizations. Some of my favorite ones are those that lead whole organizations or whole um, thousands of pregnancy care centers across the country where they're providing care for women with very young children and pregnant mothers, especially those that are low income or abortion vulnerable. You can check out Heartbeat International or Karina International. You can find a lot of these links at the liveaction.org website where we have resource pages, but find your local pregnancy center, find your local maternity home, find your local foster care or adoptive ministries and find ways to volunteer. Our willingness to get into the community and actually serve the families that are needy is the answer to the abortion crisis and the way we can practically help people choose life. The next thing, is to take responsibility for the abortion clinics in our community. What does that mean? There's an abortion clinic very likely miles from your college, from your school, from your home, from your dorm, and that abortion clinic is literally taking lives. But if we take just one hour a month 
what you do with this one hour a month can literally save lives. If you take just one hour a month and go outside that abortion clinic, you don't even need to hold signs or do or do anything except stand there and pray, pray to God for the lives of those children, pray for their mothers, pray for an end to abortion. You physically standing outside of that abortion clinic can transform the community. It can actually save lives. How so? One of the first times I did it with some other high school students, we had a woman come up to us. We were on the sidewalks of this abortion clinic outside of the Planned Parenthood in San Jose. A woman came up to us later and she said, I was driving to this clinic. I saw you guys on the sidewalk and I kept driving because I was supposed to have an abortion, but I kept driving because I saw you on the sidewalk and I thought you are my sign. You are my sign from God not to go through with it, not to have the abortion. So she ended up going to the pregnancy center. We helped connect her with them and got her the help she needed to choose life for her baby. That saved a life just standing there. 40 Days for Life is an amazing organization we partner with, and they do crusades and campaigns to actually surround abortion clinics for 40 days with prayer. And they have saved over 20,000 lives just by having people stand outside. Another great tool is to be get the training to become a sidewalk advocate. Sidewalk Advocates for Life is one of my favorite organizations. You can check them out too. And they actually have trainings you can attend so that you can learn how to talk to women on the sidewalk of abortion clinics prayerfully and peacefully to give them the resources that they deserve so that they can choose life. So serving families, taking responsibility for our abortion clinics and through the power of prayerful, peaceful witness, changing lives and saving lives just by being there. And then the last thing, which... I've already noted, but it is more important than I think we realize. I think we give lip service to this, but it is actually the secret to not only ending abortion, changing hearts and minds, saving lives, but it's a secret to our path to heaven is prayer. We should be activists. We should be active. We should be out there, but everything we do should be infused with prayer. God is the one in the end that's going to win this fight for life. He's the one that is the author of life. And the whole goal of all of this, right, is to get to heaven together and get as many souls as possible there. So taking time each day, even on your knees before bed and just saying, Lord, use me to end abortion. It's a very powerful prayer, by the way. Use me to help save lives. Use me to become a saint. I want to become a saint. The saints of uh, the early church, the saints of our church have been people who've gone out into the world, the messiness, the chaos, the injustices of the world, and lovingly and passionately made a difference through sacrifice, through trying, even when it was controversial or difficult and it took courage. So pray to God for the courage that we all need. Do the research and the study that we need to do. Be willing to engage. Do not compromise. Go and serve families. And that has to do with our sexual ethic and serving families in our communities. And of course, take responsibility for the abortion clinics in our communities. If we can do this. I believe we can save lives and we can achieve that day where we've ended abortion in this country and beyond. And we've built the culture of life that we need to build. Thank you all so much. God bless you. And thank you for fighting with me for life. 